ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 126, Science Faction ad hominem fallacy. What'd you call me? If you don't remember, we stopped doing the periodic table of the elements after we ran out of those motherfuckers and moved right on after the fundamental forces to the logical fallacies. This, of course, is the ad hominem fallacy. It's basically the argument that you, you state that because somebody is a certain person, their argument is invalid. For instance, that's what Hitler thought. Therefore, that's a bad argument. Well, it turns out Hitler, while being a horrible person and having some debatably interesting ideas also was right about certain things for instance hitler was very right about two plus two equaling four and if you were to try and argue uh two plus two doesn't equal four because that's what hitler thought you'd be making the ad hominem fallacy it actually sneaks its way into arguments more often than you think in a little bit more insidious ways that aren't as clear as that people will say oh look you're supporting this idea that the westboro baptist church supports so automatically it's defunct it doesn't mean it's defunct you can be suspicious of it but at that point, you're arguing against the person, not the argument. And even horrible, bad, wrong, stupid people can have right arguments. I, I don't want to get too into it, but I think the presidential debates are going to be really, let's say, entertaining. Yeah, and just the same thing. Take Donald Trump. Donald Trump's obviously an idiot who says crazy <laughs> shit all the time. That doesn't mean that every once in a while when he says something, he's still not right about that thing. That's why you always have to remember, whenever you're doing something rhetorically based, you have to attack the ideas and not the people. Is it that he's wrong, or is it that you're offended by the truth? I, it, I could be offended by the truth, but he's still wrong. <laughs> but that's no reason to discount everything he says. So you have to, It's also lazy thinking, too, because it's basically dismissing an entire series of beliefs that somebody might have based on the fact that you don't like a specific thing that they have or that they do. I want to be clear, this is not to be confused with ad homophone. Uh, the logical fallacy. Hey, 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 I think that that's oh, that's where you, <laughs> that is where you attack something <laughs> that means the same as the person. <laughs> yes, like uh, Big Bang Theory. What I'm referring to, your Big Mama. Right. <laughs> Fair your enough. Big Easy Mama. Thanks for clarifying that, David. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my own big fat mama, Mr. Damien Mercado. <laughs> Damien, how are you doing tonight? Still easy. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, our science expert for the evening, Mike. Mike, how are you? Doing great. Glad to be here. And right. prude as fuck. And here is along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego in the Madhouse Comedy Club. Come on out, see some live shows. And then when you're not checking those out, go ahead and check out our website at www.thescienceFaction.com for the citations of all the articles that you hear here, as well as some that we didn't get to. But for now, let's get right on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. Guys, some interesting articles have come out recently. I'm glad to finally catch up on some of these. A uh, big one coming out that's going to change a lot of the biosciences as we know it. A all-new CRISPR. Looks like it's debut. Sounds delicious. I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the sour cream and onion. And <laughs> <Go> KFC. <laughs> no, so we, we've talked about CRISPR before. For those of you guys who don't know, CRISPR is pretty much the biggest thing in biology right now. It is essentially the tool that allows us to directly edit DNA. It is amazing. And we stole this tool from bacteria. This isn't something that a scientist decided to create just out of nothing in a lab someplace. So this is like a reverse Prometheus. Uh, instead of man stealing you know, fire from the gods, mm -hmm. we've stole CRISPR technology from bacteria. You know, despite your constant attempts to make bad points, Damien, that's actually a pretty good point. That is how this worked. <laughs> we did take CRISPR technology from bacteria. We essentially noticed that bacteria had these mechanisms for editing out certain parts of their own genome. We co-opted that we took that and found that oh man we can use this exact little guy who runs in there and edits a little part of the gene we can use that to put in what we want and we've been using that in labs ever since we're now on the second or third generation of crispr in bio labs and it is what's given us a lot of the results that we've seen in biology especially in microbiology in the last few years it has dramatically changed the game we had a, the ability to edit genomes before in a very haphazard, bulk-like way that was nothing like this. This is the difference between, you know, whiting something out on a, on a typewritten paper and, and writing something in. 
or word processing and just deleting and putting in exactly what you want. This has really changed the game in terms of biology. But up until now, that has been a thing that we've used to modify DNA. Now, those of you who've taken a little bit of biology know that the alternate to DNA, RNA, actually carries out the transcript space, but it's also, not only does it, does it carry the information to what will later become the proteins, it's also the genetic blueprint for things like viruses. So viruses, uh, some of which are large DNA viruses, they, they have DNA, but most of them use RNA as their backbone. Most of them have RNA as the thing that allows, that basically codes for what they do. Do the DNA viruses walk around a little cockier? Yes, they do. They absolutely do. They're larger. They, we call them large DNA viruses, so they've already got that going for them. They is look way like cooler in Wayfarers. It's like an angel that's gotten its wings. If you destroy somebody's life as a virus, you get your... That's DNA. exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, you have to evolve eventually to get to that DNA. No, so this RNA is really important for making temporary changes in any generally large DNA-based animal because you can change it temporarily from, from essentially the coding. The RNA can read the coding on the DNA and then transfer it to a protein. So you can make changes that wouldn't be permanent like they would be if you changed the DNA in those particular organisms. Or you can go after organisms like viruses that don't have DNA and only have RNA. That's really neat. That's the power of RNA CRISPR. Now, this RNA CRISPR was discovered exactly the same way the previous DNA CRISPR was, which is we found it inside of a bacterial cell. So instead of changing the DNA and inducing a permanent change in mm -hmm. the organism, you would just change whatever RNA has been produced? Right. You would change the RNA, which essentially the RNA kind of goes through the DNA, mm -hmm. reads the part that it needs to read, and then takes that over to the protein functioning molecules and helps make it. So you can change just the RNA. You can change the manifestation of that DNA and the proteins that it creates as opposed to the actual DNA itself. It's huge. It's really huge, right, for temporary changes, things that you want to try or experiment on, or things that don't need to be lifelong treatments. I need a crab claw just for my fight tonight. I don't need a <laughs> right. crab claw for the rest of my life. Right. We'll give you the big fiddler crab hand, uh, as you've been known to do. Call me the pincher for a reason. <laughs> and by the way, as I've told you numerous times, you don't actually need a larger hand when you're fighting these fiddler crabs. You're much larger than them anyway. You can just beat them with your normal sized hand. I want when I spawn on these eggs to have earned it. <laughs> and if I, yeah, I could just throw a bunch of crabs out of the way and come on some eggs. Like, I'm, I, I'm, of course I can't, but I'm an honorable man. And speaking of that, I would like to point out that one of your arms is already bigger. But <laughs> regardless, this is, this is something that we stole again from bacteria. In this case, we were looking at bacteria as they were getting infected with what's called bacteriophages, which we've talked about before. That's a virus that affects bacteria. It's, it's specifically geared to infect certain types of bacteria. And we were watching some bacteria as they were getting hit by these, uh, these viruses coming in. Again, these viruses are made of RNA. They would come into the cell, and the bacteria had this RNA CRISPR that would go up and cut these viruses up before they could get in and infect it. We went, oh shit, we can use this the same way we've used the bacterial CRISPR, and all of a sudden, this, new, this whole new frontier was born. I'm, I'm trying to picture this in my head. Is it like a, more like a blender? Is it like a samurai inside the cell? Samurai. Or, Absolutely sam samurai. Yeah, he's, he's making... Samurai. Yeah, and he makes very <laughs> precise cuts at exactly... And you can, you can determine exactly where you want those cuts to be. You can put in new things in the place of the old stuff. It's... Very, very neat and incredibly powerful. We're starting to use this technology in, in actual applications, so this is no longer just a theoretical thing. And as we're doing it, we're seeing that it's effective. It is working similar to the way the bacterial CRISPR was. Now, this is going to take years of refinement in the same way the old one did, but it can really open up whole new doors in viral treatment and especially if you're thinking the treatment of genetic illnesses where it's hard to actually modify your entire genome of, of every cell in your body. If instead you could just modify the RNA that codes for those proteins, you can solve the problem without having to do this entire body-wide thing. So if you had uh, some genetic disease that deprived you of uh, protein, mm -hmm. you could solve it. All right. So to that extent, what if it's just genetic dwarfism? Could it just be one very painful growth spurt with... Yeah, I, so here's how I imagine this happening. You got a guy, he's got dwarfism, he comes in, he's like, I hear you got this new uh, RNA CRISPR thing. You inject it into his arm. And then if you've ever seen the old 1970s show with Lou Ferrigno the Hulk, <laughs> uh, he turns green and then starts murdering people. <laughs>
Which was, is why he was cursed to be a dwarf in the first place. God works in mysterious ways. He did that for a reason. Mysterious. He did it for a reason. <laughs> he knew what he would become if he had the size. This guy was a dick in his past life. He deserved to be a dwarf. So uh, about that, what do you guys think will be the unforeseen consequences of this type of technology? Well, right off the bat, I think that uh, if you can directly modify viral RNA, mm-hmm. I think it would be much easier to weaponize or... Make That's actually early. a really good point. I hadn't even thought of that because you can now, instead of what a lot of weapons labs had done in the past with viruses, is essentially you breed them to be more and more specific sure. to their target and stuff like that. But with this, you could go, oh, we want the infectiousness of measles mixed with the uh, rabies lifespan, mixed with all this kind of stuff and put together and have a very killer. Good point, Mike. You know, you might have just given some terrorists some ideas. So Great. think about That's that when that happens. Point. Just as we had to have nuclear weapons as a deterrent against other people using nuclear weapons, mm-hmm. I think if we could aerosolize this, we could create uh, on the gay gene a gay bomb and threaten the South <laughs> into submission. <laughs> so the idea is we tell the South we have this new RNA CRISPR. We can alter the RNA that's reflected in you. And therefore, we're going to go after the genes that cause people to be gay. We're going to make everybody in the South gay if you guys don't s- start bathing or something. Like, we just use that as a thread. <laughs> well, it's like, like, we have a laundry list. It's like not we, any one thing. It's like Iran sanctions. From, like, one of those in, like, Flynn movies from the 60s, the gay bomb? Sh- I, I mean, I'm sure. <laughs> I think Why that's... haven't I jerked to this before? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the gay bomb was a movie that I've watched, but I don't think it's what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, on to article number two, GPS scramblers. This is a really interesting and somewhat mysterious one. Kind of been making the rounds on the AM radio stations, if you happen to click over there. The FAA is warning that mysterious tests this month will scramble GPS signals on the West Coast. Like mysterious tests, like they never answer your questions fully. <laughs> um, they're just smoking a log cigarette extender wearing a veil. Yeah, they're, they're, the mysterious tests involve the guy with the Guy Fox mask on. So the dates are uh, June 9th, June 21st, June 23rd, June 28th, and June 30th. And here's this creepy thing. They have released no clue as to what it is that they're doing and why this is going on. All they've said is the signals will be scrambled in this area of the western United States, parts of Mexico, during these time periods. Be prepared for it. They have to tell you that because otherwise if you're like a pilot who happens to use your GPS as your navigation or anything like that, you can be in pretty bad shape. This will probably also affect us as low as ground level, though their reports kind of skew. Some, most of this will be aerially, but a lot of this will still hit at the ground level down as low as 15 feet above sea level. This could quite literally fuck your drive up and mess your commute up. Hi, I'm Alex Jones here. First time on the show. Long time listener, first time caller. We don't have callers usually, but yes, that would make you the first time caller. Thank you, Well, I'm I'm shouting from across the room because I have a large, jowly voice. I was here in the Madhouse Comedy (laughs) Club here in beautiful downtown San Diego. If I was a comedian trying to describe your voice for somebody to try and imitate it, I would call it jowly indeed. Yes, yes. I'm glad that you and Damien certainly didn't discuss this before the show. I'm glad to say. Alex, you know what? I got to say, this is one of those times where conspiracy theories are going to come out, and it's not as crazy as they usually are, because this is a weird event. Turning off the GPS to the West Coast for a few days, that is kind of weird. What, let me just ask, for shits and giggles, what do you think is going on? Well, I think this is another example of Obama's government <laughs> coming in and saying we can't, Atlantis Rise is only one day every thousand years. And of course he's going to turn off GPS because Obama wants to play golf in Atlantis. Okay, so this is this has to do with Atlantis, and he's shuttering the GPS, assumingly so nobody can track him when he goes to Atlantis to, as you say, play golf for the day. Ironically enough, it's the one day of the year you can drive on the ocean. <laughs> what? They should really let people know about that little fact. Forget the GPS. Nobody would care. That's another thing Obama doesn't want us to know, because then we could investigate Deepwater Horizon. Well, I'll tell you what, Alex, and you know, we'll go through this with you because this is kind of interesting now that you're here. We'll talk about the few clues that I kind of ascertained by looking through the details of this. Like I said, they're not given no information. They are completely tight-lipped on this. So I started looking through and saying, okay, well, let's look at how GPS works, and let's see what that says about the areas that they're working in and what they're saying will happen. Now, if they said there's going to be a global-wide GPS blackout at some point, Naturally, the assumption would be, okay, they are doing some tests on the satellites themselves. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're saying. They're saying it's going to be in a localized part. So some people who might not necessarily be familiar with GPS might think, oh, that means they're playing with the satellites that are directly above the western United States. GPS satellites are not geosynchronous, meaning that they are not the same satellites over 
you know, California the entire time. The, the satellites spin at a different rate than the Earth itself, and therefore, if you took out any particular one or two or three satellites, it would not affect the same location over that amount of time. Well, your first fallacy right there is believing that satellites aren't a conspiracy invented by the Obama government. You don't think there are satellites? I do not think there and are satellites. And I would comment that satellites have been around a lot longer than Obama's been in office. <laughs> well, first off, that proposes a circular Earth, which is... Yes, we do have a round Earth, of course. We don't have, you know, I don't even know where to begin. I'm just waiting for Bigfoot to enter this conspiracy somewhere. <laughs> He's my ride home. <laughs> so, Go on, I, let, me hear, let me hear the rest of this lie you right, have. Right, so if we're doing some back of the envelope postulations, there are some possibilities. One is that they're going to affect satellites intermittently that happen to be the ones that are over the West Coast at those times. That seems unlikely to me. Because that would mean that you would, at, on each of those days, you would have to hit each of those satellites at each of those times in order to make that happen. What seems more likely to me is they're doing an atmospheric test of some kind of thing that is going to block or possibly get in the way of GPS signals. Now, GPS signals are just radio waves. So what is it that blocks radio waves? Well, there's radio interference. There's physical objects. I don't think they're going to put a giant copper plate over us, so I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. But you can do that with radio objects. Now, what is going to block out certain GPS signals that won't block out things like radio transmission? Tinfoil hats. <laughs> Tinfoil hats would. They would work pretty well. They absolutely yeah. do. Yeah. But you got to think this can't block out regular radio transmissions. Otherwise, we would have this same uh, this same warning going out that said, "By the way, you know your your local FM station will be off air on this day." It's not going to be. So it can't just be that they are doing some kind of experiment that involves the GPS band of radio waves going on in the West Coast of the United States. Those experiments have to take place over the course of five days that are spaced out. Mm. More so a few weeks apart, though the last ones are kind of grouped together in the last week and a half. Okay, so now we've kind of ascertained what they're most likely doing. Why they're doing it is a whole nother question. Do either of you guys have any ideas? Why would we be doing these type of radio wave tests on the West Coast during this time? Why are we doing it? Why now? Are you asking Damien or Alex Jones? I'm asking everybody in the room, which would, of course, be both Damien and Alex Jones. He's across the room. You yes. have to shout to him. He doesn't have – you don't have the natural acoustics. His voice does. Well, yeah. When we, were, when we were setting up the audio, I realized that if he's within eight feet of the microphone, it just reds everything out. So, I'm glad I come through perfectly. My studio was very large. Well, uh, so GPS has been around for a while now. Right. And it seems to work pretty well. So if they're messing with it, it's either to make things better or worse. Or unrelated, because they could be doing something that just happens to be on that band, you know, on that radio band. That's true, but that's a dedicated GPS band mm-hmm. that they yep. don't have anything else on. So it's got to be something to do with controlling or disrupting GPS activity. And that might be it. It might very well be, and this is you know a little conspiratorial of me, but it might very well be a test to see how do you disrupt GPS in an emergency. You know, if, if you have GPS-guided missiles, which we know that some countries use, how can you disrupt that in such a way that would affect a broad enough area that a missile flying through it would be completely lost? I'm, I'm picturing a North Korean ICBM with a Garmin Nuvi yeah. as its uh, control <laughs> little, module. Little Little Tom Tom. <laughs> turn, turn left. Turn right to blow up White House. <laughs> left at Andorox. <laughs> or you get the Snoop Dogg one. Yeah. Take a left at Oakland, bitch. I think this is the uh, the answer to this is obvious. I've talked about it and on my ra- on Alex Jones's internet radio show many times, and it's it's a plan to cause mass chaos. Pregnant women will be able to arrive at abortion clinics. Uber rides will be needlessly long and expensive. <laughs> it's an Uber-sponsored outage. <laughs> Trump supporters will go to Bernie rallies. Bernie rallies will go to Trump rallies. It'll be madness. The Obama administration wants this. <laughs> I do think, yeah, I, you know, it is interesting. This is one of those things that hit the conspiracy buttons that I'm, I'm a little bit less skeptical about. I always kind of want to hear what this might possibly be, what the legitimate reasons are. Aliens. Yeah, yeah it's true. What, I mean, well, here's another question. What do you think the unintended consequences are going to be? I mean, look, Alex Jones put out some, some very reasonable ideas <laughs> just now. Agreed. <laughs> but what happens, you know, when your average person who is an Uber driver, like you said, Uber is heavily reliant on GPS. What happens to those people on those dates? Do they just go, no Uber? I say any DUI that happens on that day, <laughs> be stricken from the record. That's the FAA's fault, everybody. What if, and this is, you know, I'm, Alex Jones has, I, I have my own conspiracy theory. What if 
President Obama's been on the phone with aliens a hundred times, tried to give them phone directions. They just can't find the place. So we have to shut off our GPS so right. that they can find their way here. Because so they, they have space Uber. GPS and it's interfering. <laughs> And that would mean that the aliens are coming to the West Coast. Good choice, aliens. Good choice. Hey, what, you want them going to the Middle East? <laughs> Do you want them going to fucking Brooklyn? Well, I thought they were going to be going to Washington, D.C. That's usually where they go in the movies, that right? That place is a swampy shithole. It is pretty humid this time of year. We don't need to be around there. You should come to the beautiful Madhouse Comedy Club <laughs> at the, with the gorgeous skyline here in downtown San Diego. It'd be an honor to be abducted from here. <laughs> <laughs> very, very interesting stuff. I, it's actually personally affecting literally my work because I have to plan my work days around this now because uh, you have to take very precise GPS coordinates when you find a site. So I have uh, some survey days coming up that I literally had to schedule around these. So maybe it's just me that's pissed off about it. But I feel like once it happens, everybody's going to be really angry if their GPS doesn't work on those days. You work with a lot of natives, though. Mm-hmm. You'd think that one of them would be able to market or know with their knowledge of the land, know the exact coordinates. Right. They do this thing where they throw like a feather up in the air and then when we come back, it just leads us. It just comes down like the Forrest Gump feather, but leads us right to the site. <laughs> that's offensive to Native Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what's offensive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move right on to our follow-ups. Welcome to the follow-up, because science articles are a lot like children, and that sometimes you need to visit them more than once. All right, guys, two quick articles to follow up on that we've talked about in uh, recent previous episodes. Uh, The first one, which is the last episodes we did for the periodic table of the elements. If you remember, we talked about uh, 113, 115, 117, and 118, and we all described that with those names, like un un octium and all that kind of stuff because they hadn't officially been named yet well as of this week guys great news four more elements added to the periodic table they have officially been named godzilla got approved i really <laughs> love that idea not too far away yeah how many did the asians get this would this would have been groundbreaking right uh, well it depends where if you consider russians asians i mean because I, I do okay <laughs> geographically i do 113 is a uh, nihonium which is a japanese element named after the japanese researcher who found it now, we actually, when we did 113, if you go back, discussed that they would probably name it Nihonium. That was one of the, the leading ones. Are you sure it's Nai? I, have, I am it, not sure. It's uh, Nihonium. Oh, it's yeah. Nihonium. You dishonored a lot of ancestors <laughs> there. All right, sorry, Nihonium. Uh, number 115, Moscovium, of course, for Moscow and Russia, even though I would like to point out, as we discussed when we were doing this element, discovered in Dubna, Russia, which is in kind of like the greater county state, whatever, of Moscow, but not Moscow, the city. So uh, don't you get always, that confused, you ignorant, ignorant comedian, Damien. Always shitting on Russia. You know what? Like, Russia doesn't need your help to be shit on. <laughs> it's a, that's on their own. the most depressing element named after the most depressing capital and major city in the world. And, of course, Tennessee, uh, named after the U.S. state of Tennessee, which is known for science advancements. I mean, when, when you think scientific advancements, you think the state of Tennessee. The poster state for science. Breakthroughs in slide guitar technology <laughs> happen in Tennessee every day. Yes, of course, Oak Ridge Nuclear Laboratory in Tennessee, one of the few things where people can read there. And <laughs> how much state pride does your average like Tennessee? Hell yeah, I support two things. One, Texas Tech, the Tennessee Titans, and Tennessee. Go Tennessee. <laughs> of course, 118, Oganason, which sounds more Japanese, right? A little bit. Uh, I very honorable element. <laughs> Ogana son. <laughs> I just bow when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, which of course was named by the very proud father of Ogan. Uh, so let's move on to the second follow-up article, Finding Sites from Satellites. We talked the other week about how stupid that idiot French-Canadian kid was. <laughs> Thought he found himself a Mayan city because he correlated it with star maps because he's an asshole. I have talked to several people, listeners, yeah. who say you are way too harsh on that kid. I've, uh, let, let me talk to you listeners right now, <laughs> just so you know. He's a fucking asshole, and so are you for supporting him. A lot of, all of them side with that mom you were in a verbal, an almost physical altercation with on Facebook. Listen, obviously we know there are assholes in all countries, but I'd like to thank this kid for proving that the biggest ones come from Canada. So if you don't remember, this was a kid who correlated star maps 
to Mayan cities, because again, he's an asshole, thought he found a whole new Mayan city, turned out to be a, a, what might have been a pot field. Way to go, kid. And we went through why that was total bullshit and stuff. But as I brought up, this is not a ridiculous idea to go look through satellite photos to try and find archaeological sites. I do this. Real researchers do this. And in the case of real researchers doing this, things get found, as they recently did this week in Petra. Uh, of course, all of you guys with your deep classical antiquities knowledge remember the history of Petra. But uh, for Damien, we could just reference it as... Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the big sand building he went in at the uh, end. I thought it was the pterodactyl <laughs> from the land before time. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I like how this has come full circle uh, back to uh, some really great examples of ad hominem attacks yes. <laughs> on, on a Canadian asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the asshole now? You are! <laughs> See, there's American assholes, too. It's not just Canadians. Who's the ad homophone now? <laughs> hey, attacks based on your gender preference are totally ridiculous. I prefer he and or she <laughs> when she arrives. He, she. So what did they find? They found a 56 meter by 49 meter platform with an eight and a half by eight and a half meter building base in the middle of it. The pottery around suggests it was built around the second century BC. It was part of a larger complex. Now we knew there was a bunch of stuff going on in this area. We had discovered a bunch of stuff around it. This was just a new particular site within that area that we had discovered. Very cool. This is the proof that this type of archeology span is useful. It works when done right. It's very interesting. And annoyingly, it doesn't get reported nearly as much as that idiot French-Canadian kid who fucked up. <laughs> it's not nearly as big a story because this is real, and this is how real science works. This is done by researchers looking through this, though you don't have to be a professional archaeologist. You can be an idiot kid in Canada, and as long as you don't start with stupid ideas, you'll be fine. Just go look for sites. You don't need to correlate them to star maps. You'll be good. Right now, there's a kid in Canada... Who's treating this like his Kill Bill? He's training. He's uh, he's he's getting a Hanzo sword made, and he's coming for your Expect ass. Expect to knock on your door anytime. If your fighting skills are anything like your science skills, I have nothing to worry about. Can't wait till after I call BS to see at the end of the episode who got more of your vitriol. You know what? To you, kid, and any offended French Canadians who are thinking about you know coming out and, and teaching me a lesson. Allons-y, motherfuckers! Bring it on! Let's go. So I, I know that uh, we're giving the kid a hard time because uh -huh. uh, he used a really crappy method to make it an actual discovery, though. And I think we should take a minute to recognize that he did find something, even though his method of finding it was complete. He found like crap. a cornfield. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of those. But he found a cornfield, right? He should get like a little participation <laughs> award for that. You treat him with the same contempt that the CDC treats all French Canadian airline attendants. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow, that's uh, a as deep a, joke. As the band played on reference, nice job. <laughs> All right, let's move right on to everybody's favorite game. I call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. All right, guys, this is I Call BS, the game where I read four science articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yes, and I'm actually kind of surprised you haven't. Uh, you still refer to me as a panelist. Like, mm -hmm. you give me... At least lip service to the same status that Mike has at the beginning of the game. I'm surprised you haven't created a lower... Like, we have one panelist... Yeah, yeah that's right. ...and one gimp yes. that we take out of a crate for the show <laughs> and sit here. We unzip the leather across his mouth, remove the ball gag, and he's allowed to play this game. You know what, Damien? Like I said before, even sometimes you have good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, article number one. A new study indicates that dogs were actually domesticated from wolves twice. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. And if you know anything about training dogs, the reason it had to happen twice was because in the middle of the first domestication, he got up. So he had to start all over. Nope. Right. So it was just... Domesticate uh, again. It was, it was done on purpose because the first time just kind of halfway didn't work. Yeah. We killed Damien all the dogs, started over again with wolves because mm -hmm. the first dogs got up. Damien ran out of peanut butter, so he had to start over. <laughs> Before I came, too. Nobody wins. <laughs> and Mike. Uh, I'm going to say this sounds like science to me. Um, it sounds like a rare event, but one that could definitely happen more than once, unlike something like uh, uh, eukaryotes developing mitochondria. I think that's a much right. rarer event. Something like dogs, though, sure, it could happen multiple times. All right. Article number two. A new study indicates that modern non-African populations are genetically less fit than African ones due to ancient incest. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and it's kind of something that there's evidence of today. All the best incest porn is never black. 
That's it's true. That's few. that's actually a good point, Damien. Most of the good incest porn is not black. I used to think it was because the man was keeping uh, black <laughs> incest porn down. <laughs> right. But uh turns out maybe there's just no interest. There's a long history of suppression of black incest porn. When you call everybody brother and sister, all the taboo's gone. <laughs> And Mike. So are they suggesting that it's the non-Africans or the Africans that were committing ancient incest? The non-Africans. Well, i got to go with science on that one. If uh, Clearly, incest produces uh, more offspring showing recessive genes. So I'd say it's science. Very good reasoning. You're a black dude. What do you want? White bitches. Where are you least <laughs> likely to find them? The home you grew up in. <laughs> good point, racist Damien. I'm glad the show has its own gimp. <laughs> Article number three. Scientists may have just come up with the first ever cure for multiple sclerosis, and it's the same cure they have for HIV. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science, and the cure is the same. Stop having sex with dudes. <laughs> At least we don't limit our bigotry to uh, racism. We go for homophobia as well. Listen, I, I feel like... You're not insulting me nearly as much as that kid. I'm trying to step up my game. I'm like the I'm like the bad kid. Like right. the good the good kid just got in trouble. So now the bad kid. That's my racket. You're, I got to step up my game. You're trying to get more attention because you don't have crappy celestial map theories. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try to make my next answer anti-Semitic. We'll see how we do it. Yeah. You know, you say you're trying to step up your game, but we're two thirds of the way through the podcast. I haven't heard one dong reference yet. <laughs> You are the, disappointed. the great auditor of this show. You keep <laughs> us on track. Thank you. The, the dong auditor. <laughs> I Which, like the sound of that. Yeah, well, it no, sounds actually, like the no, wor- I Wait, wait. No, I don't. Yeah, that sounds like the worst supervillain ever. <laughs> it's an elected position like Comptroller. Yeah. And nobody really knows what it does. It's, <laughs> it's elected dong auditor. All right, Mike. Uh, uh, has scientists found a cure for multiple sclerosis, and it's the same one they have for HIV? I'm going to guess science is probably some new variant on CRISPR or retrovirals or something like that. All righty. And lastly, a new discovery on the island of Flores indicates that the hobbit, Homo floresiensis, is most likely to be a deformed Homo sapien rather than a whole separate species. Damien, is this science or bad science? I must admit this is a challenge to make anti-Semitic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know that Indonesia really... Come on, Lost Tribe. Okay, Come on. There you go. It's like I'm seeing the racist gears working in your head. <laughs> They're Volkswagen bad. gears. <laughs> this is bad science. We know what a deformed skeleton looks like. We have enough deformed skeletons. We can go into any Israeli graveyard and prove my point. <laughs> you really made it to the, uh, to the anti-Semitic comment. Wow. <laughs> my joke made you, it halfway around the world. Yeah. You took a story about Indonesia and made it anti-Semitic. You could chirp my joke like an Indiana Jones traveling scene. <laughs> You're like the Bobby Fischer of racism. <laughs> All right. And Mike. Uh, I'm going to guess on this one as well because I think the, the paleontologists involved also were guessing – This is science. All right. Let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. A new study indicates that dogs were actually domesticated from wolves twice. Both of you guys thought this was science. And this one is science. Uh, Very interesting study. We've been in this debate back and forth about where dogs were domesticated. Because some of the genes seem to suggest China. Some of the genes seem to suggest Eastern Europe. And it goes back and forth. Due to some very complex genetic analysis that has to do with referencing the DNA of ancient dead dogs and ancient dead wolves, it looks like we think that we might have domesticated them twice. Those two domesticated groups then interbred to create what is now the modern dog, and both of the groups that they were domesticated from, both the wolf groups they were domesticated from, are now extinct. So it's a very interesting story of transition throughout life. We know that we, as human beings, essentially created dogs by having scrap piles that wolves would come by. And the nicer ones that were more docile, that had less aggression, that got along better with humans, could get closer, had more food, better reproductive abilities. Therefore, they bred more. And in a very short time from the fossil record that we see, sometimes maybe in a few generations, we see wolves, full-on gray wolves, turning into dogs. And that may have happened more than once. In fact, that might have happened multiple times, but it looks like the genetics show that, the, that two times that it happened led to the modern species of dogs, all of them which are pretty closely related. All right, article number two. A new study indicates that modern non-African populations are genetically less fit than African ones due to ancient incest. Both of you guys thought this was science, and this one is science... Very, very interesting. All peoples who come from areas outside of Africa are slightly less genetically fit 
than their African cousins because of incest. And here's the most interesting part. The incest wasn't even in our own species. The incest was in Neanderthals. So Neanderthals, very small population over a wide area, lived for a long time. There was a dramatic amount of incest in their population. Because of that, they had a much less fit genome, one with a lot more problems, a lot more deletions that were harmful, a lot of issues that came along with it. That's why we kicked their asses. That's the thing. We're thinking now that might be why we kicked their asses because we were able – because if you think about it, even a couple percentage points difference means that your child survives and the other one doesn't. We talk about fitness. We talk about – can an embryo survive? Every embryo is going to have some natural genetic variation that causes problems, that causes issues where that embryo can die. The less fit you are, the more of those problems there are. So for every conception that you have of a homo sapien you'll, you know, and you give birth to, there'll be a conception of a Neanderthal that does not make it to term because of that, that less fittedness. So you're a homo sapien. You move next door to uh, Neanderthal neighbors, yeah. and you try to make friends. Like, go hunting with Gorgak. He's, he's nice. He brought over. <laughs> and you know, he's tripping over himself. You have to save. He almost falls on his spear three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, they were very well inbred. Like, That's he, absolutely he, true. He falls on his spear at some point. People are so going to blame me for this. This, I mean, all the Neanderthals die like that, and they're blaming. And so, well, and then so what happened is, uh, as we've discussed many times before, all non-African populations of Homo sapiens interbred with Neanderthals and have Neanderthal DNA. We absorbed some of their unfittedness. It now equates to about one percent, and so therefore, all non-African populations are about one percent less genetically fit than their African counterparts because. We had to have sex with those dirty Appalachian motherfucking Neanderthals. All right, Gorgak, stay back. <laughs> I'm going to do the hunting this time. You stay and, and protect the homestead. All right, me can do. <laughs> oh, Gorgak. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very interesting study. Super, super interesting results. Article number three. Scientists may have just come up with the first ever cure for multiple sclerosis, and it's the same cure they have for HIV. Both of you guys thought this one was science, and this one is science. They followed a similar thing to what we talked about with the Berlin patient, which, if you remember, was a uh, time that we actually cured HIV. With the Berlin patient, they realized, hey, this is affecting his white blood cells. What if we get rid of his, all his white blood cells? In fact, let's get rid of his whole immune system, clear out his immune system with heavy chemotherapy. Then we'll go to his bone marrow, which creates your white blood cells. We're going to give him the bone marrow transplant of somebody who is immune to HIV uh, naturally, which is somewhere around 4, 4% of the population. We're going to give him a bone marrow donation from one of those people. Then his white blood cells will now be immune to HIV, and he'll be fine. Basically, they got rid of their immune system. That's how they cured one man of HIV a long time ago. This is a similar process, except they don't actually have to do a transplant of that immune system because they're not looking for somebody who's immune to multiple sclerosis. What multiple sclerosis is is it's one of a series of autoimmune disorders in which, in this case, your immune system attacks your nerves. It attacks your nerves in your brain, in your body. It has horrible dramatic effects. We, up until now, we had no cure for it. And the idea is if we replace your entire immune system, maybe we can keep it from attacking your own body. So what they do is same thing, heavy chemo work, wipe the body out of its immune system, and then they take uh, stem cells that they harvested beforehand and restart your immune system essentially from scratch, giving you an immune system that is not targeted to kill your own nerves. They've already done it once in this big study. Now, the study was a small N number. There was only 24. One of the people unfortunately died during the study because of the procedure. Wiping out somebody's immune system is really traumatic to their body. But out of the people that survived, it looks like they have stopped exhibiting the signs of MS. We can no longer see evidence of their nerves degenerating from being attacked by their immune system. They may have cured these people of their multiple sclerosis for the first time that we know to have ever happened. But since nerves don't heal, how much of the damage is permanent? Is well, it, do they... It, they don't see a progression of the, the continual nerve degeneration. And we're talking about the myelin sheath. And we don't know that they can't heal altogether, though it's very difficult to heal a nerve. But the myelin sheath is just part of that nerve. There are instances in where it seems like we might be able to put some of that myelin back. But if nothing else, we can stop it at, at its stages from degenerating into something that will eventually kill them. 
Very, very interesting stuff. Again, you know, this is a, a costly treatment. It's one of the reasons you might say, wait a second, we cured HIV. Why aren't people cured of it? Well, because it cost them 200K. And so they didn't, well, I mean. Cheaper than just shoveling your face full of stem cells, which was the previous right. treatment. <laughs> well, this does involve stem cells to restart the immune system. But super interesting stuff. I hope that goes really well for all those people with MS out there. Article number four, a new discovery on the island of Flores indicates that the hobbit, Homo floresiensis, is more likely to be a deformed Homo sapien than a separate species. Damien thinks this is false. Mike's thinks this is true. And this one is bad science for Damien's first win in such a long time. Racism pays off. <laughs> it pays off. Yeah. So you're attributing your win to your anti-Semitic slash racist slash homophobic comments throughout the game. I, I owed it to my spirit animal, Donald Trump. Uh, we're both doing great <laughs> things in this world and we're going to take it straight to the White House, baby. <laughs> The the Mercado Trump ticket is make, coming to you this November. Make America inbred again. <laughs> Indeed, this is false. Now, if you guys have remembered this entire story of Homo floresiensis, I've gone over this a bunch of times, but we'll, we'll re-hit it a few times. We discovered this skeleton only back in the early 2000s on the island of Flores. It was a tiny little hobbit species, very small, like three and a half feet tall. Basically, what most of the cognizant researchers that I was around were saying was, oh my God, this is a great new species, but a few were heavy detractors, and I have no idea why. Their logic didn't make sense, their science didn't make sense, but they were basically saying this is a deformed human with microcephaly. There's no way this is a, a whole new species. They argued that the brain case was too small. They argued that the size was too small. They had a bunch of arguments that didn't seem to hold water to me at the time and still don't seem to hold water, but they continued to argue it. That camp has gotten smaller and smaller over time, but they were still around. They're, they were still vocal up until last week, which is when they published the results of a 700,000-year-old Homo floresiensis uh, skeleton. The ones we found before were only about 50,000 years old. So they figured, oh, look, there's just one or two little fucked up people over here. No, we found out that 700,000 years ago, these guys were running around the same island. That's interesting for a few reasons. One, it means it wasn't just a deformed person. That's clearly a new species. Number two... This happened really quickly. We think Homo erectus, which is the precursor species that we think led to this, this particular species, we think it only got onto the island of Flores a million years ago, meaning that it only took less than 300,000 years for that body shape, the homo, that species, Homo floresiensis, to derive from Homo erectus. That's a short amount of time, and then it stayed relatively stable from 700,000 years ago till now. That's longer than, than Homo sapien has been around by three times. So that is a significant amount of time for this little guy to be running around on that island. It's definitive, absolute, objective proof that this is not a malformed Homo sapien. This is absolutely a new species, and it's one that's been around for a lot longer than we have. That's, that goes back to when you know, Neanderthals branched off. Is it possible that in Homo floresiensis society... They just started looking at being small as being very in vogue and it changed their sexual habits. So conversely, if we humans could make Honey Boo Boo's mom the most the epitome of uh, sexual Helen of Troy, if mm -hmm. you will, could we not be a different species in 200,000 years? Yeah, absolutely. Years? We would, if you just chose from the extremes of human experience, like if we, all we did was breed Shaq with Mini-Me and like do like weird experiments like that, yes, we would absolutely change into a different group after a while. I mean, why are we doing eugenics yeah. <laughs> right now? We really should what, be, right? What, what, what is, you know what? somebody abused this or something? What is? Full circle. Ad hominem attacks on eugenics. Ah, oh, Hitler was doing it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> As I always say to everybody, you do eugenics every time you go in a bar and go, I want to fuck that one. That's eugenics. That's you deciding those are the genes that I want. Whether or not you realize it, that's what's going on in your head. And maybe in my version, we sterilized a bunch of people. Maybe yeah. that's also part of the equation. <laughs> maybe that's how I get off when I'm at a bar. <laughs> All right. Congratulations, Damien, for one of your first wins in memorable history. Uh, way to go. That's fantastic. You've uh, overcome the adversity of being you to such an extent. And uh, congratulations to Mike for playing an honest and uh, very good game where you didn't use any racial slurs or win by random guessing. Let's move right on <laughs> to Noble Nerds. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where we honor Noble Laureates. The world's most educated virgins. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where a man whose appearance on an episode of Sesame Street was described as uninvited and <laughs> disturbingly phallic tells you about other great men. The word of the day that day was therapy. Today's nerd is Germany's Max Born. Max was a physicist and mathematician who won the 1954 Nobel Prize in Physics for his instrumental work, in the development of quantum mechanics. 
but only if left unobserved. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a joke for the nerds in the audience. I will keep going. For the non-nerds listening, quantum mechanics is the study of physical laws very different from our own Newtonian physics, which we experience in our daily lives. Quantum physics are the physical laws on the very small scale, such as atoms, and Bobby's sense of impartiality, and I call BS. <laughs> also, his penis. <laughs> Max Born served in the German army in World War I, helped to establish Germany as a leader in physics, and worked with Brian Cranston's Heisenberg. Despite all of this, when the Nazis came to power, Max, who was Jewish, had to flee to England, where he wrote the very popular book, The Restless Universe. Not to be confused with Restless Universe Syndrome, which is about a shaky universe. <laughs> that is a funny joke in German. I don't know if it translates properly. I have one question. Bobby, using science and educating the listeners, could you turn that sweet German burn about your quantumly small amount of impartiality in I Call BS into a positive? Yeah. How about this? I don't know if, if I'm flipping this around so much, but how about I note an irony that you decry the way I treat you during I Call BS? Well, this very week in I Call BS, <laughs> being so blatantly anti-Semitic... <laughs> Right before describing a scientist whose career and almost life was ended by that exact same anti-Semitism. <laughs> yeah, but it's funny when he does it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sweet Jewish joke. If uh, Hitler was uh, that, as that comical when he was anti-Semitic, I don't think that uh, the Jews would have taken it so harshly. <laughs> Yeah, it's how you blast that joke just because Hitler liked it. <laughs> yes, uh, who is being the hypocrite now? Is uh, <laughs> eugenics? Thank you. Uh, this has been Noble Nuts. All right, and thank you, Mike, for coming out and joining us for one twenty six. Thank you, audience. I want to remind you, please subscribe on iTunes. Leave us a comment if possible. Please leave us a comment. It's one of the things you can do, and. I'd appreciate it if you told Bobby to fuck off. Yeah, uh, or, you know, maybe comment about how you feel about Damien's homophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, general smell, any of those things. Yeah. Listen, five stars when you leave the review. Otherwise, if you're not going to leave five stars, fuck off. We don't need your goddamn review. <laughs> yeah, they're probably some kind of different race. Yeah. Listen, if you're Jewish and you want to leave your opinion of this episode and my performance <laughs> and it's one star, get the hell off. Oh, and hopefully you guys will join us back next week for Science Faction 127. I do not feel that it is necessary to uh, say any additional offensive comments than what has been stated on the show already. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Mm-hmm.